How's going? How's going? Welcome aboard. It is I, TJ. Welcome. Uh, and I've been hanging out. Um, you all know that I do business in Durban, in another area where I do not stay, which is like, what, 600 kilometers from me or so. And I've been meeting other fascinating people whilst I'm there. And uh, today I bring you a lady called Amanda Mklongo. And um, she's fascinated me in terms of how she does her business. Quite modest in most of the times when I engage with her. You don't even think it is her who's doing all of these things. But I thought, let me bring her on so that we can have the discussion of her journey. Amanda, welcome aboard. And how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, TJ. How are you? Greetings to all the listeners and those that are watching as well. Nice, nice. Amanda, I've been, we've been bumping or rubbing shoulders with each other for the last maybe three, four years uh, from the first time I met you. And who is Amanda? Oh my goodness. Amanda, I'm Amanda Mshongo, obviously, as you've already introduced me. Right. I grew up and I was born in the Eastern Cape. Right. Uh, in East London, to be more specific. I studied there all of my basic education and then I moved to Cape Town where I studied uh, tertiary and then uh, started working. Yes. Nice. nice. All right. So when did you move to Devon then? Oh, I moved to Devon about 15 years ago. Wow. Um, okay. Yes, it was a family decision. All right, good. And 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 actually, you you've just hit the stone on you know some of the places that I like to visit. You said to me it was a family decision, so which means that you've got a family, uh, and you are still you are still a woman who's a family uh, who is a family, and you're still in business as well. Oh yes. All right. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I want us to come back to that point as well, because I continuously meet younger women who continuously tell me, TJ, no, I can't do property. I want to do property, but I can't do property because I'm a female. I don't want to be taken advantage of and things like that. And, and it's something that I would like us to touch on, on your experience. Actually, maybe we can touch on it now, um, on how you have experienced it yourself, being in, in property. Oh my goodness, uh, obviously there are those chances that are going to take chances as they are everywhere in society. Right. But once people recognize that you know what you're talking about, you know what you would like to achieve out of what you're doing, then even when they try to take chances, they're not successful because you're able to engage with them and say, this is what I would like to have. And then they can't give you anything else. Otherwise you won't be, you won't pay them for something that you, you're not looking for. So it becomes a business arrangement. Um, I think at the end of the day, once people can see, you know, what you take, you're talking about, then they are, they respect you for that. I like that. My wife is in property. I've got two female business partners. Uh, you are number four. So that means that anyone can do it and oh, yeah. irrespective of gender. So we've got that out of the window. Now we can actually talk about Amanda, how did you actually start in, in property? Where, where did this come from? Oh, it was, it was such an amazing journey. I had a grandmother. When she yeah. passed away, I was surprised that she had so many properties. Really? My mother was the eldest in her family. And uh, she all of a sudden was responsible to manage these various different properties that my grandmother had left for her and her siblings. So that's how I first got exposed. And I was shocked that everybody has a house that she has left for them. Yeah. And even today, some of my relatives are still getting um, rental income from those properties that she had left. And maybe she bought up 50 years ago because I was probably 10 years old when she passed. So it was absolutely amazing. And that fascinated me that there is wealth that can continue after you've passed on. Yeah. But that's how my fascination started with property. Amanda, you say that by the time you your grandmother passed on, you were around about 10, 10 years old, right? At that time, uh, how many properties did your grandmother have? Do, 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 do you know? 
oh my goodness, she had about between 10 and 13 wow. properties. Yes. And, 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 there, she had, and, and there we are. We are she had seven. Yeah, go ahead. She had seven children right. and uh, some other children that she had raised. And each of them had a, a property of their own, including businesses that she had left for them that she was renting out. I five to your grandmother, man. Oh, I I, I respect her even today. Yeah, because you know, I, I I hear so many stories of people that say people of color are not doing this, people of color are not there, people of color are not doing that, and I'm always of the view that, and I didn't know about this about your grandmother, by the way. Um, and this is my first time hearing about it. And, and I'm always saying, guys, you know, what we focus on, that's what's just going to grow. So because we're just focusing on, you no know, people of color are not in this place, people of color are not color this. Where are the stories where we can elevate the people of color that do have them? Because they're there. They're there. We just don't talk uh, strongly about them. Because, you know, someone the other day, they were snapping on... Um, uh, the books of maybe uh, of Robert Kiyosaki is together with um, um, now the president of, 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 of America. And they're saying, but these are all the books that we hear. Where are the local people's books? And I was saying, we don't market ourselves enough, those who have books, or those that are, have made it, they are not having good PR to demonstrate how they've done it. So we don't know. Their stories just keep on in the corner where they are, where they've achieved with the little people that are within their circles. But yeah, I'm fascinated around your grandmother. I'm, I think I can, we can just dedicate a chapter about your, about your grandmother because, yeah. So where did she have the majority of the properties? Uh, she was in and around East London because okay. that's where I grew up. Right, right. And, 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 what kind of business was she in? Now I'm fascinated. It's now about your grandmother, Nea yeah, Amanda. Sorry. It's all <laughs> about you. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to talk about her because she's such a motivation for me. Sure. She, she had uh, farms. And in the farms that she had, she had shops that supplied right. the rest of the people in the community. Right. So she had, in every farm that she had, she had obviously had her own homestead. Right. And she had houses that she was renting out to different families. And she also had a shop that she was running, obviously, as a property. Right. Um, she also, she had three different farms in different areas around East London. Right. And she had houses. Others were houses in and around East London as well. The house that she lived in, of course, and the other houses that she had that were a lot smaller. And, and my, my uncle, who, who was her son, yeah. grew up and then started a, a brick-making company yeah. to support the, the properties that, were always, that they were always maintaining, improving, uh, even buying vacant land and building on it. Right. Um, so it became a real big family affair. Yeah, I mean, if you're now in this space, I think I should, I'm not even qualified to ask you, how did you stumble in this year? It, it, it's like you, it's in your blood, you know, it, it's everywhere. Yes, absolutely. And, think, and the fact that my mother had to manage it now. So in my right. older years, I would go with my mother to make sure that the properties were well maintained. The supervisor was there to manage the property. There were people and you had to drive a bit of distance between these different uh, properties. So, but it almost was like a, a natural thing for them because they didn't make such a big deal of um, formalizing it in terms of the employees. But when I grew older, I realized that, oh my goodness, this woman had a trust that was running these properties. Exactly now what we're learning <laughs> in such a <laughs> Don't <formal joke>. <laughs> So, yes. Oh, wow. I, I am... Fascinating. Where did she get all of this information? I mean, you well, you were 10, you wouldn't know. Um, I mean, we speak about all of these things and we like, 
this is new to all of us, so we think this everything is new, whereas these things have been around for a long time. Um, and, and our um, awareness is now heightened, so now we get fascinated to say it's new to us, but it's been around all, all of the time. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I, I actually don't know where she got it because I got to know the details when my mother started running it. Sure. And I started, I started business. And then on holidays, I would be an accountant for my mother. <laughs> so I would record all the papers, take all her receipts to take them to her accountant because she was also learning as she was going along. So I think I just went into the journey with her. And um, I'm now surprised when I started business and I started attending seminars that, oh my goodness, this is how it all came together from the academic side. And I also realized how tough it is to put it together when I started doing it myself. I'm like, okay, this is not as easy as they made it look like. Mm. Um, but here, yeah, at least they imparted that love and that sense of knowing that it can be done. That was, that was absolutely great. I think I think we just want to sort. I I just want to honor your grandmother, right? Um, that's number one. And number two, we've always been talking about legacy, and these three generation of women where the legacy can be felt, touched, seen, and you are still a living testimony into it. And now you've got your own kids. So that's actually the fourth generation. Um, and over and above that, the structures have been done correctly from the beginning of the first generation. And now you're just carrying on the button. And in that relay, Amanda, because it's a relay now, the foundation has been set. You, you, you can't almost like say, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, on school holidays, you were immersed in it, and now you're taking on, taking on the button at, at, at whatever level it is, you know, your grandmother having like 10, 15 properties, and now you carrying on, um, and you've got a different mindset of how you want to implement things, right? How did you sort of like connect what is there and what you wanted to do and I'm connecting here where you are now because I know you as a developer, I know you as a as a property investor, and and I actually didn't know about you know anything about your family structure that this is where you, this is where the foundation came from. Um, but how do how did you actually connect that? Um, initially, um, I did not realize how much value that was. So I thought having to go to some university and start, I also studied business management and economics. So I thought I'm definitely going to do better. I'm going to be, I looked forward to running a big corporation in actual fact being employed. I thought for me that was a lot better, you know. So only when I was in the actual cooperation, running the corporation. But initially, the first thing that I realized is that the pay slip was of great value for me because then I could go to the bank and get uh, a loan to purchase a home, which is the first thing that I did. Right. So based on my experience, when they said, oh, you have a pay slip, oh my goodness, even in addition, you have a housing subsidy. The first thing they did within three months of working was to purchase a, a very small property at the time. So based on the legacy that I had, I had the knowledge to know that I mustn't rush for a car, for example. The most okay. critical thing that I could do for myself is to purchase that property, even if it means some of the other luxuries I did not have, but I had at least that initial property. So it, it's great that I had that background, because the initial thing is that I wanted to own a property and I knew that I was building a portfolio, even though I didn't know the details that came with it. And I thought at university, I'm going to learn all these things about how it comes together. But unfortunately, I didn't. Um, but the, um, the critical thing is that as well, I knew that when it was time for me, two years or three years down the line, I purchased another property. But now this was supposed to be a little bit of a home with a little bit more space 
I did not sell the initial company like most people would, would do. I did not sell the initial um, uh, a flat that I had bought. I rented yeah. it out imme- immediately and I moved to the new one. So that's how I built my own personal portfolio. Because remember when my grandmother left, he left this, she left these properties, but she made sure that she gave it to the number of different, my uncles and aunties, those that were her children and the people that she, so by, by the time that now I was older, these properties had a number of different owners who did not necessarily continue with building the, the portfolio of properties, but they used the properties as either a place for them to stay or they rented out that one property. Fortunate enough, most of them did not sell the properties. So I obviously moved on and got married. So I started my own portfolio. So it, the, the, the education that I got from them was definitely a, a stepping stone for me. But in terms of purchasing the properties and having a portfolio that belonged to me, I had to start from scratch. Uh, it's still what I call the unfair advantage. Um, which I think at many a times we do not see it and we don't realize it because we are in it. And only when we have gone out there, that's when we realize, oh, I, I actually know this. I, and you executed at ease. Uh, a lot of people that, that I come on onto the show, uh, Amanda, when I speak about them to say, how did you actually start? And a lot of them speak with fear of, I was just afraid to start. Um, I was looking at this thing with a, a, a microscope to just see that, is it worth it or is it not worth it? But to you, I don't even hear that because it, it was in you. So when you got that first paycheck, your mind already was more around, I have to buy a house, right? And, and you say you looked away from stuff like luxuries of a car. And yet for some people, we, we were thinking that a car is a necessity. You know, I fell into that trap. Um, I didn't want to be in a taxi anymore, but th- for the last 30, 40 days, I was in a taxi. And immediately I said, well, I want to go and buy a car because I just didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Yes. Even when I purchased my second property, I still didn't have a car. So only after my second property, then I purchased a car. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Um, Amanda, where are you now? What, 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 what type of business? So in property, there's quite a bit of things that people do. We speak of your grandmother that was running a McDonald's style business. Um, she had a shop and she owned the business. Uh, so she was in the business of real estate, but having a shop on top of it as well, which is a cool model. I like it. I haven't come through to actually experience that business myself, but I, I, I'm fascinated with it. Um, and you get people that do, I mean, student accommodation, a whole lot. I know you as a developer, right? And, and let's just talk about the type of business that you're in. So you've got your own uh, family portfolio that you are doing for your family and uh, your trust and things like that and your own family that you've got, but you're also running this as a business. So you've got a business that you do this. What What is it that you do? Um, I'm going to talk about my latest project that I was involved in. Okay. You go and scout for the land and see which land where there's demand, where there's economic vibrancy, where there's, I focus a lot on the entry market, so to speak, those people that have just graduated, they're looking for a place to stay, um, a starter home, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, They're looking for a place to stay and they, at the moment, maybe haven't found how to go about to do it. So they need it ready. So I would go about and scout for a land um, or a rundown property, but lately you don't find a lot of those, but you find land and then build on that particular land um, and try and build for the demand that is in the area. Obviously you do your research, what is needed in that particular area. Um, The area that was in, most people appreciated homes, 
So I scouted for, for the land and I built a couple of homes in that particular area. And in the area, there was a couple of schools around it. Uh, it was a relatively new area. There's schools, so that means the families are looking to take their children to school. The teachers that are employed in that school are looking for a place to stay with their own families. So that was kind of like my, my, my targeted market. So that's the, the property that was in last. And then I developed it, made it ready, um, and then the family moves in. And then I negotiate with them whether they're interested to purchase the property or they're interested to rent the property. So by the time I finish the development, I know that this one is targeted for somebody who needs to rent and this one is targeted for somebody who would like to purchase. Okay. So this development that you speak of, Amanda, how many units did you build all together? It was actually houses, three houses uh, in the latest development in that particular area. Three houses, okay. Now, I want us to talk about from the beginning, because I think we speak about, you know, let's go and scout for land. And we all see empty lands and they're like, yes, we can build here. We build and then you go to the council, they say no. Um, what do you look for? Um, and, and I know that you have spoken about it, but I want to juggle you more so that, you know, our audience can understand a little bit deeper to say it's not just about picking up the land, it's not just about seeing is there a school or is there a hospital close by, there's a little bit more to it, right? So when, you, when I've seen a piece of land like that one that you're talking about, I can visually see that potentially I can have three houses because it's easy, that you can visually see, right? Because you can see a house there, a house there, a house there. Um, but what is more important is the compliance work and how do you get around that compliance which is the my biggest headache uh, and maybe that's why i don't do development um, for me it takes a bit of long I, I like doing stuff i like action developments is like laid back for me i made the mercy of someone to say yes i get frustrated a lot um mm -hmm. but amanda you in it you like it and yeah just walk us through the compliance process there okay um first i need to mention this usually yeah. i would have properties for investment purposes okay those that i would have and put a tenant in and then continue with the maintenance which is less involving and a lot more immediate so right. i would usually have the development and the investments going concurrently nice, nice. so when i'm going into the, the development i am clear that i am patient and i'm working long term into the future mm -hmm. so wh while i'm involved in the development um i make sure that i have the time to do my research on the property right first it takes time to even purchase the actual land because you have to negotiate with whoever is currently owning the land and then the next step which is probably somewhere while you're negotiating with the people you're also negotiating and finding out from the municipality uh what are the bylaws around the land can you do the things that you need to do in the land so you the research and the gathering of information is very important in the initial stages so once you've got the information from the municipality and you've got the buyer willing, uh, the seller willing to pay to sell it to you at obviously the, your own desired price because that as well becomes such a, a long time to negotiate. Um, you, 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 you obviously capture the land. But once you've captured the land as well, there is a process of trying to engage with the stakeholders because you, you're right when you're saying there's a lot of things that are outside your control. And sometimes in business, you need to bring a lot more in within your control. But with development, you have to master the art of planning and negotiating. So the idea of talking to even the neighbors in the area that you are, you are intending to develop in, you, you need to have the space to develop some form of relationship or at least be able to watch them or understand who are the community leaders in that area so that the people kind of buy into your process. Um, so you need to be very patient, especially in the first year of, of the development. 
Um, and then once you've uh, negotiated with the municipality, submitted your, your plans or at least your proposal, um, and then obviously whatever they say, your guess is as good as mine because they sometimes in the middle of the whole process adjust or change some of the bylaws uh, depending on whatever is coming in or they, you, what you want to see, a new neighbor could come in and say, no, th this is what I intend to do in the property, which might not necessarily be in line with what you want to do. So you need to be in, your feet need to be on the ground before you even start the process. The actual building process is the, actually the last phase of everything when you're actually building and selling. And in, as well, when you having the plans, that's the time as well you should be scouting for the potential buyers. Ideally, by the time you start building the property, you know exactly who's going to be staying and who you're making the property for. So I think there is a lot of balls to juggle in the air. And yes. some of it is, there's a lot of wind as well that could blow your ball to any direction. Yeah. So, and I think the, 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 the calculated risk, um, it, 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 it's very important to make sure that your risks are calculated. You know you're taking the risk, the risk is calculated, you know the stakeholders that are involved and you are in continuous negotiation with them. What is the most, um, maybe, maybe one or two things that you would say would be a shortcut to a quick success on a project like this one? If you know that a little bit earlier or, I, or, or if, if, it's some, if the property comes with X, is there a shortcut that you can create in development um, when you're doing projects like these ones? Mm, the, the ideal thing is to yeah. invest in a property you already know. Okay. Where you already are familiar with the bylaws, mm -hmm. you are familiar with the, how the municipality executive thinks, which direction the municipality wants to take that particular area. Right. You are familiar with the community leaders in the area. Um, if you found a, a, a property where the previous owner already has approved plans, that also shortcuts your, your process. Right. Um, yes. So if you can find an approved plan and you immediately find a buyer, then, gee, you've cut the, the whole process in half. And you also have a contractor that is experienced, that you've worked with before, mm. who understand your thinking who understand your vision, who then you don't have to continuously negotiate with the contractor. They can foresee the time frames. They understand the type of, the type of pressure you're working under. That yeah. time is very important. Um, so uh, I think having those stakeholders already in place, those strategic partners, is actually key. Right. Uh, obviously, also including funding. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very important aspect of, of all this dynamic. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, um, if I want to come back to, to the processes, right, for me, it almost sounds like, like three to four things that are important. Um, the first one being the zoning needs to be in place. If you get to a place and that place is zoned correctly for what you're trying to do, so that's shortcut maybe number one, right? And um, and, and I want to mention two things and then I want to throw in a curveball. Um, then the second part is that the owner of that place has already zoned it and they already have the plans to do what they're wanting to develop. Now, that's a shortcut, yes, but the reality is that someone else has done the work and potentially that piece of land where you might have bought it for, let's say, 100,000, all of a sudden, with those two things in place, that piece of land could be a million now. You're, you're absolutely right, which is why you also require patience in scouting for it. Right. It's very important to approach the person at the right time, the yes. person who's selling the property. Right. Because if you approach them just as they've come up with the idea of selling, their expectation is really high. But if you wait for them three months down the line, maybe even six months, when they're now realizing that there's no takers or 
they've been frustrated with the takers that didn't have approved uh, funding or whatever it is, the process now is not moving as fast for them and they have other plans. So if you zoom in right at the time when they are starting to feel desperate, then their negotiations become a lot easier and a lot quicker for you. So that's why for me, patience is really key in this game. Uh, and as well, understanding the, the person who you're trying to buy from. So whatever is happens to be the issues for them, maybe they want to move into another area. So if you are in a position to find them the property, the ideal property for them, where they want to move to, then your negotiations as well become a lot easier because then their mind is already set on doing something else. You just help them and propel them to where they want to go so they easily let go of this past. Because for them now, the current property that they want to sell, it's their past, they don't need it anymore. It doesn't serve them in any way anymore. So if you try and negotiate and try and meet the person's needs who's trying to sell outside of just the price, then um, you're able to negotiate and perhaps have the win-win solution. I, I, I am, I'm of the view that I think is property entrepreneurs, people that play in the, in the property space, whether they see themselves as an entrepreneur or not, uh, but basically isn't when you're buying. Amanda, you've just mentioned the most critical thing that have made me to walk away on a deal with very little money as a, as a buying price. For me, understanding the seller and saving the seller, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, once I have started saving him, right, it becomes very easy to understand the, the root cause of why he's selling. And then it becomes very much easier also what in, my saving, in, in my saving attitude to help him on that part. When you help him on that part, his burden is off. So he's now willing, he's now more open for what you are bringing forth. You know, I, I remember at a point, Amanda, I was buying a house uh, out in Boxburg, I think it was. The house was labeled for about 800 on the market. It's an old three-bedroomed house. Um, extremely run down, extremely run down. I, I spent an additional 300,000 to, to bring it back to life. But the reality of this guy was that he was, I didn't know he was sick. But you could see from the way he walked that there's something wrong here. So the day that I viewed the property, something in my spirit just, just like nudged me to ask, you know, if, if we were to buy, if you were to get the money today, what are you going to do? You know, and he said to me, he is actually scheduled for a, um, um, for a surgery. So the money is coming in and he's going to for a surgery. Immediately my alarm went off. And I asked, so how much money do you need for the surgery? And he said 110, but they need 50% deposit. Sure. So when I came back with my offer, I gave deposit of 200,000. A cash deposit, yeah. A cash deposit, because that's what's going to solve his problems, yeah. right? But then the house that was on 800,000, I eventually bought it for 350. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so I gave him the 200 cash and I said, this is available in the next 24 hours, but I can actually buy your house for 350. And the house was so, there was, it was an office, it was a home, it was everything and they had left. So everything was in there. And what then eventually happened in their Amanda is that it was now a junk place for them. Yeah. So this guy is sick and he's not able, he's elderly now. So I said to him, okay, great. I will take, don't worry about the junk that's in here. I, I will look after it. I made another maybe 30 to 40,000 with the junk that was in there. Wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> And in the desk that is in, in my office today, <laughs> I got it all from this house. And that desk, you need about eight strong men to carry. 
Um, so, so I relate very much to where you're talking about to say, you know, you need to save people before you actually, you know, start throwing in to say this, you, you get a little bit more value by just giving people solving their problems, then it becomes 100% a win-win. I relate to that. Absolutely. Wow, that's a very touching story, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And some of those benefits that you get when you are in this space, um, there's lots of untold stories of cool things that you start getting. You know, recently, um, my mom wasn't feeling well and she needed to get an operation. I've got two business partners who are doctors. And one oh. of them facilitated that. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? And they, mm -hmm. Yes, we could have gone to the hospital and everything like that. But all they did is they cleared the path for me to go and see the right pro professor, um, mm -hmm. the right specialist. And had we gone to see the specialist, it would have taken us nothing less of two weeks to go and see him. But because of my relation with my business partner, we, we were told tomorrow, if you want, do you want him to come at your house? He can come at your house if you want. You know? Wow. So, wow. so I don't know, Amanda, from your side, what are some of the benefits that you have seen so far? Um, we, we all chase for different types of benefits, but some benefits fall into our laps. Um, some benefits, they are there, we don't even see them. Um, for instance, this doctor scenario, I didn't see them until someone said to me, uh, don't you know a doctor? And I said, yeah, I do. Actually, one of my business partners is a doctor. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it wasn't, I wasn't thinking. What are some of the benefits mm -hmm. that you have seen so far in, in being in property? I know you yeah. have a business sure. that gives you 100% of your time with your kids. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um... There's a lot of benefits. And I think one of the things that I personally took for granted that in property, there's a lot of relationship building. That right. is a very important aspect of, of, because we're looking at the building itself and we're not thinking beyond it. And, and there's a lot of relationships. This, this story that, that you've just mentioned now, I'm really touched by it. <laughs> that, you know, it, it, you, you're getting value where you didn't expect the value, you know? Um, but for me, the, the benefits of, of property, I, I love how it engages you initially when you're building up the project. You have to have proper planning, you acquire the property, you put the systems in place. And then from then on, it's literally an income that's almost guaranteed at certain regular periods, you know? So until there's a need, at a certain point, which is becomes once in a while, then you don't have to really consistently be overlooking, especially if your property is a good property, well managed and you have systems in place. So I love how it gives me time to be free, to focus in, in, in my family. That's when for me, the work balance is, is really key because I, it's very important for me to be there for my children, for the sports, for the classroom, for pickup, um, to be there at home as a wife, as a mother, that's very important for me. And so property is able to give me that. I can manage my appointments accordingly. Yes, there are times in the middle of the night where the pipe is going to burst and you happen to have an apartment that's <laughs> on the top floor and the bursting pipe is affecting everybody else underneath. And yeah. then you have to go deal with that emergency. But even that emergency, at the most, it occupies you for an hour or two hours, as long as you've called a couple of people to help you sort it out and you arrange the funds to be able to make sure that it happens and it happens well, it doesn't occupy you that much. But I love how it gives me freedom for my time. I love how even in that development, I'm patient, I'm working on it but I can still work on other properties. I don't have to deal with one property at a time. Um, I, I really love that. I also have found benefit where I think about a year ago, I needed, I needed, I needed money desperately and it was emergency and it was to help and support a, a parent as well. Obviously we have elderly parents. And I think for me, it was so important that I just looked at my portfolio and decided which property am I going to sell because now I need a lot of money. And 
I decided to go for a property that I bought, okay, it was way back, but I bought it for about 100,000. And all of a sudden, this property was valued to about more than a million rand. And it was in an area that was very well in demand. And I sold the property within a month uh, in a, with a million rand. And I, and I got a cash buyer because the property was right next to the university the, and the timing was perfect right when the parents were coming in to looking for properties for their children to start the new year. So it worked out perfectly and I love that about property that as much as it's a long term strategy, but it's almost like you have money you are keeping out there. On desperate times you can always tap on it um, and it, it, for me it supports the area that I have value for the most family. It supports the fact that I can be there for my children. It supports the fact that in this particular in instance, I was able to be there for my parents when they needed uh, health uh, related uh, support uh, in their elderly. They both subsequently passed, but at least I was able to buy another year or two with them around. Imagine if we could not do that operation at all with all that money, that wouldn't have happened. So, so property, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just appreciating the fact that I, I ended up knowing and understanding how property works. And because it gives you that stable income, it gives you even the immediate income if your property is in the right place. Uh, it also gives you regular cash flow from the income rentals perspective. Yeah, but I don't obviously have a touching story <laughs> like you now where <laughs> the doctor was immediately available. But for me, it's given me access to money and it gives me access to time, which are yeah. the two things that are very critical for me at the moment. Yeah. Um, Amanda, I want to almost go back to your project. Um, the one that you spoke about, the three, the three units that you recently bought. And something that is just daunted on my on my in my mind now is that you have the ability to develop you've got a strong team i have tapped in in some of your network before um and over and above that you choose which ones you're going to sell versus what the demand of the market is and which ones you're going to to hold on to and because you're a developer it basically means that obviously your your building uh, cost is less uh, compared to if I was just the ordinary guy who's coming out to build. So for that reason, that that particular unit that you're building there from day one is cash flowing. Yes. Right. That's no, that's number one. And then number two, if you have your three uh, um, uh, units. Um, um, th three units that you've built now on this one particular stand, the likelihood of you selling one property and then it brings back all of your money, your capital, is very high, isn't it? Absolutely. So we, which then means that your capital is back, potentially with some profits, if the, if you, if the, the deal was good on the buying of the land. Um, and then on the other two, it's it's money for days for the rest of your life you're banking that money absolutely absolutely um for, for me the idea is to get the money even without buying without selling sorry sure the 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 the, 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 the key is never to immediately sell except if at that point in time i have another initiative that i would like to invest into and then get the money and i'm for seeing that I'll get it a lot quicker or there's an emergency. The, the ideal situation is to buy it to hold so right. that I always have access to the property, either when I need cash or the passive income for me appeals a lot more. So I have to have a really good reason for me to part with the property. For example, in these particular properties, the one property I ended up selling because the, the, the one person who was really interested was willing to pay cash for it. And obviously it was going to give a relief to all of my partners, which my the contractor, everybody else that I had worked with. And then we had a little bit of bonus and at least we give ourselves um, something to encourage ourselves to move forward. So the, I like the idea of um, 
selling because there was a willing buyer at a right price and he was a cash buyer. So that worked for me. Otherwise, the other two, I held them back and I'm happy to hold them because the, the income long term is a lot longer. For example, the property that I sold for a million rand, it had been on rental income maybe for 10, 15 years. So when you actually calculate how much money you've received from it, from inception, and the money that you use to sell it, it's no brainer. It's a lot of money. So for me, the idea is to keep the property and hold it as long as I'm able to find the correct tenant. The area is right. You need obviously to find an economically active area. An area, people in the entry market are happy to rent out. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the upmarket properties uh, yeah. because then those people are, can afford to purchase their own properties or they are on contract well. if they come. Yes, they have a lot of, so the entry market is key for me because those are the people that are looking for stability. They have young children. So holding it is, 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 is key for me. And most of the time, they don't have access to the bonds to be able to purchase their own properties or they haven't thought that far. Other people have, don't usually think that far that I can get a property even if it's a small one. Sure. Other people are thinking when I get a property, it's going to be a really big one. So the smaller version of it, they are happy to rent out. So and, yeah. holding it for me is, is, is key because then it guarantees my income um, consistently, I need regular income for my. That is also, also income that I can get without working hard for it. You know, while it frees me yeah. to focus on other initiatives and other businesses that I'm passionate about. Mm. Um, Amanda, in general, what what is the worst time period that you have had on a small development like this one, and what is the shortest period? So your worst case and your kind of like good space. Ah. Uh. I've had the shortest period of three months okay. where I've started a project from beginning to end within three months. And uh, when I got the project, it was pretty much zoned and the plans were in place right. and there was a, a, a buyer. So my job there was to take it over, adjust it a little bit, and I had the ready uh, partners to be able to build immediately and move out of it. So right. that, that was a, a great price and that gave great returns and it was a cash buyer as well. So, but the longest property for me was five years. Wow. And, um, <laughs> yes. and, and that was the mistake I will never repeat again because I purchased land without, I, I got excited over how cost effective the land was. Right. And I got the land at a good price and it was an offer. I jumped into it. I took advantage of it. And I hadn't done my research on what needed, uh, what, what was the zoning for the area. I hadn't done a lot of research around it. So I bought the land with the idea, I'm going to see what I can do with it. Okay. So, so that took me longer to put those processes in place. And the fact that I, I just was not uh, organized around that property. So it took me longer. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and we, we call that school fees. Um, yes. You learned along the way, uh, but definitely none of your other projects have hit the five year mark. Uh, <laughs> you're clever now and you now know what to avoid, what not to do. Yeah, good. Amanda, yeah. if there's any tips that you someone who's out there, they were thinking, hey, development is for me. What are the kind of three tips, maybe two, maybe even one, uh, that you can give them to, to do, to be successful in their, in their development? Because this is an area that you, you do very well. I like your model where you scout for land, you develop, you hold the land, because I know you, you've, this place that you've built, it's a sure place you know exactly the ins and the out of this building that you have built you know if it is units that you're building whatever that you're building but the property itself you're a hundred percent and you've put in good quality stuff that you know is going to last you for x right so your maintenance is almost next to none i mean you always have stuff to maintain because people are people that are staying there but 
it's it's much less compared to going to renovate uh, five units that were like built in 1950 and now you're repurposing them. You know, I've seen the difference there. Um, what are the tips that you can give someone out there who's trying to, who's thinking of developing? Um, oh, it is very important that each person understands that a property is a financial decision, not an emotional decision. Usually we think, oh, I just like <laughs> that land. Oh, I like that house. I Oh, I love it. You know, yes, yes. Um, I love the color. I love the kitchen. No. <laughs> My heart. <laughs> yes. No. A definite no. Yeah. It is a financial decision. And then only after the financial, uh, the financials are in place and you see that they're suitable for you, then you allow your emotions to kick in. <laughs> but the emotions can't go in first. And then the, the second tip that's really critical before, for me, which I've spoken Before you about. go on to your second uh, tip, uh, Amanda, have you fallen in love before? The five-year property, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to make that obvious, but it really sounded like that was your emotional project. <laughs> okay. Yes. The, the, the five-year the five curation was definitely an emotional decision um, and I've definitely learned from it. Um, sure. And then the second one for me is patience, which I've already mentioned. You need to go in with the idea that I'm not in a rush, even though you are in a rush, but clearly define your steps so that when you go in, you, you, you don't feel the pressure, otherwise you don't think straight. Sure. And then the, the last one for me is the importance of due diligence which I think is linked to these two aspects. You have to make sure that you do your research, you do your planning before you even purchase the property, before you put your offer on the table. Make sure you've done your analysis. You've identified who your potential stakeholders are going to be on the project. You have clearly defined what, you're, what you want to use the property for and the numbers are coming together. At least have an idea because there's going to be surprises and at execution there's going to be surprises but at least reduce those surprises nice amanda thanks a lot for being here with us and uh, i want us to go through into the last segment where we kind of like talk anything and everything but um this is about you i've enjoyed my conversation with you i've learned quite a bit and i just need you to answer that question with anything that comes to mind. So the question that I'm going to ask you, the first one is that um, if you are not doing what you do best, how do you then find the time to just chill out? What, what do you do to just chill out? Oh my goodness. Now, yeah. first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I've also enjoyed this time with you. Um, I like walking at the beach, the pleasures of living in Devon. Nice, nice. Uh, I take a walk at the beach, uh, a leisure walk at the beach, or in my backyard playing with the kids. Um, just at, at my backyard playing with the kids or with a little bit of a motivational, inspirational book. Um, yes. Those are the, the, the few things that I do for, for relaxing. Nice. Is there any particular book, maybe one or two, that you'd like to share with us that are your favorites? Oh my goodness, yes. The, the recent book that I've read, which has uh, shifted my mind, especially around business, The, the Blue Ocean Strategy okay. by uh, W. Uh, Ch uh, Chan Kim okay. and Renee Mobon. Right. So those, uh, that, that's, that book I've been reading over and over again because it's, it's challenged me to, to, to think about what value do I bring through my business um, and then what is it that is unique about me that I make sure I allow it to, to, to flow through my business and bring and service other people through it. Uh, so I appreciate reading that book and every time I read it with a different mindset or I'm in a different stage then it, it just does a lot for me. It, it helps me think of just one more thing I could do better. Mm. If you are to give yourself, your younger self some advice Amanda, um uh you look young by the way but you if you're younger um <laughs> <laughs> what 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 would that advice be 
Ah, uh, my the younger my younger self, I would um, I would tell myself to be a lot more courageous. Uh, be, feel free to take a lot more risks. Uh, but obviously, the risks must be calculated and must operate within my strengths. But I must just feel the fear and go for it anyway. Nice, nice. Amanda, have you ever thought of doing anything else other than business, other than property business? Um, at the moment, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm looking into coaching because I have a very strong background on economics and management. Okay. So business coaching and um, life coaching is something that I'm, I'm looking at because I realize there's a lot of information that I've, I've, I've built over the years that a lot of people could use. Um, and there's a lot of people that continuously ask me questions about how did you do this? How did you get to that? How did you do that? So I would like to make it a lot more structured. Um, so coaching is what I'm looking at at the moment, but more on the life coaching and business coaching uh, and perhaps even leadership uh, coaching as well. Good, good. Um, the last one, Amanda, is... Um we are all joining this for different reasons. Um, for some it's money, for some it's just having the time for you to spend with your kids so that you don't, uh, we are not pressed for the time or the money. Uh, so you can spend freely your time with your kids. Um, but to you, as we are joining on in this success that's now coming up and your success is very different from my success and potentially different for the next person. But for you, what does success look like? You know, when, when you have arrived there, or maybe you've already arrived and you're already living within your success, but what does that look like for you? Hmm. It's, it's, wow, when you say success, my brain goes everywhere. But <laughs> like, does it go to Lamborghini, almost... yachts, <laughs> house on the villa? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But uh, um, what I've discovered in, in the stage that I'm in at the moment is that success is operating within my very own truth. Right. And success for me is where I'm comfortable to communicate how I'm feeling. I'm comfortable to say this is who I am, where I'm comfortable to say this is the value that I want to bring to society. And this is me. You, TJ, bring your own value to society. And I can bring my own value to society. I don't have to copy you. Preach. I can, there's something that I've got that can add value to you. And yeah. you know, and I also firmly believe that as I am comfortable to be unapologetically me, then I'm able to give you permission as well, who is especially younger, to be unapologetically you and bring your own value in your own unique way. And that sense of, appreciating somebody else for what they bring on the table and also expect, expecting to be appreciated by those that i'm called into there are people that i'm called into and there are people that i'm not called into so i'm as i'm just happy at this point to say these are the people that i want to add value to so whoever can see value in what i'm bringing let's go let's go together and continue to experience this journey of success together so that's where I am at the moment. That's deep. It sounds like it's coming from that other book there that you are reading. <laughs> the, the book that I'm reading is very focused on the business strategy. Right. That stay on top of your game. And yeah. perhaps it is linked, you're right, because it also says bring your value on the table through your organization. Yeah. Don't say because um tj is doing his property with a number of different partners i also want to do it like that will i work well with partners it's working for tj to have a number of different partners put on the table and that's his strength operating there that's why he's able to do it but do i have to do the same maybe not because then my strengths are different and my dynamics are different Right. But isn't it good for him to be have a lot of partners? Yes, absolutely. Is it good for me? Maybe not. But 
there's no wrong or right, you know. So what they, what actually they also acknowledging in the book that people are going to come and, and copy you. Yeah. Even if you, you, I decide to be authentically mean, there are those that are going to come and, and copy me. But as they copy me, the demand then is for me to dig deeper and say, where is it that I find yet another niche so that I can jump over? So they, as much as they, just when they're starting to settle on, okay, we've got, this is how she operates. And then I've just moved to the next level. I continue to discover myself because I'm never one person at one time. I'm continually, I'm continually revolve, evolving. 100%. So, 100%. yes. And, and therefore my business should be the same. That is deep, Amanda. Um, it, it is so true in the business sense. Um, so um, Nando's, I mean, we all knew KFC, Nando's kicked in. It's still chicken, but it's just a different flavor. And oh, yeah. Galitos kicked in almost identical to Nando's, but very different again. Um, yeah. And who else came in? But all of them, they're all centered around serving chicken um and you know I, I i said to my wife the other day we had gone to, to to the mall and there was all the chicken places were next to each other and my wife said <laughs> it's competition i said no it's not um nando's is for the healthy conscious and kfc is for those that are wanting to indulge their test buds um so you decide me i'm going to nando's yeah i'll see you later <laughs> No, absolutely. The target market is completely different. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Amanda, it's been great having a chat with you. What's your grandmother's name? I didn't ask you that. Oh, um, her name is Virginia Mglenge. All right. Mglenge, yes. <laughs> she, she, she just fascinates me. Um, yeah, yeah. But thanks a lot, Amanda. It's been great having you around. And... Um, Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Uh, there is Amanda, like it is any other day. We bring you a successful friend. You had a fascinating story full of, um, um, full of uh, nuggets that you can actually pick up and go and implement. And uh, I love the way that, for those that actually don't know Amanda, let me describe to you Amanda, how Amanda appeals to me. She is calm, collected, and you can never tell that she does anything in property. And she is a motherly figure and she carries her kids with her all the time, even though they are not there. And, and I've seen that's your purpose. You, you enjoy that, you enjoy, like you, you, you're so chilled, but yet in your head, Amanda, one can actually see it, or should I say some of us who are also in the business space, I can see your brains is going up and down, up and down, say, how can I achieve that? How can I achieve this? But yet in your life, you just come and collect it. All right, cool. Amanda, thanks. It's been great having you around. Thanks a lot. And ladies and gentlemen, um, you, you are allowed to ask any questions and those questions that can come through. Myself will comment if it is targeted to Amanda. Amanda should comment. And uh, thanks a lot and God bless. Amanda, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, TJ. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this time. All right, God bless. Goodbye.